Pittsburgh Simpty uh, meeting today, a uh, virtual meeting. Uh, we're hoping that in time we'll be able to do in person, and uh, I'm, I'm hoping that will be in the next couple of months. So um, I, I want to uh, welcome everyone, especially uh, students that may be attending this meeting, especially if it's your first meeting with Simpty. Uh, SIMPTI is 100 years old and has developed technical standards for many, many years. And uh, the goal of the Pittsburgh section is to educate our uh, members. Uh, Pittsburgh has become an increasing region for motion pictures and television, Buzz being an example of that. And uh, we're looking to keep our membership informed as to the latest technical standards. Um, I, I want to, as always, thank the section managers and especially the volunteers who have been nominated for section managers for next year. Um, and uh, the March meeting that is coming up will be about audio over IP. There's a multitude of standards. We'll talk about interoperability of those standards as well as how to use it and why you need to use it. And then in April, uh, Glenn Prisborski. We'll be talking about various camera systems, including DSLRs, cinema cameras, film cameras, and traditional uh, two-thirds inch three-chip cameras. And uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Buzz Moyer. I met Buzz at a Christmas party uh, at Viewpoint a while back and was shocked to find out that we had a Hollywood camera operator and it was too good to pass up. So I'm going to turn it over to Buzz. We're going to have questions and answers at the end. But if you have a question during the presentation, Buzz said he will uh, take those questions. Uh, you can raise your hand or, or uh, type out the question. Yes, so, right, John. And I uh, recommend everyone use the Q&A. Uh, don't use the chat. Use the Q&A for questions. OK, thank you, Bill. And one more um, thing, just to let everybody know, we are recording this. So whatever questions you pose may be uh, made available publicly after the event on our website and through Simpty headquarters. Great. Um, and again, welcome to everyone. And Buzz, I'm going to turn it over to you and turn off my camera. And it's all yours. Thank you. All right. Thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Simpty, for having me. This is a great honor for me to be able to speak and talk to everybody here. And I thank Viewpoint Production services for uh, having this great facility. Uh, there's some work going on here around me today. They're setting things up, so just to pay no attention to them. Uh, okay, quick overview of me. I hate to talk about me, but anyway, um, I am John Buzz Moyer, a camera operator, a gimbal operator, which I'll get into later. Um, I'm a member of the IATSE, which is uh, a engine, basically all the crews that are on, on movies are, um, Part of IATSE, uh, grip, electric, and camera, and props, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a group called the Steadicam Operator Association, uh, which I happily uh, have instructed a lot of great people, and it's been quite an honor for me to do that. Um, I'm part of what's called the SOC, the Society of Camera Operators. Happen to be on the Board of Governors Education Committee and the Awards Committee, so I am committed to a lot of things. Yeah, so, quick little bio about me, just because I have to. I was, war I was raised in Swickley, Pennsylvania. Uh, I went to school in, in uh, high school in Swickley. I started my career very early on when I was uh, 10 years old. I did summer stock theater as a dancer. That's Vincent Price. Um, so I was actually professionally uh, working as a union employee very young. So I, was, uh, I learned to be a professional, how to act as a professional. Um, and I had to perform in front of, uh, oh, every, every five days a week we had real shows. Uh, so I was definitely, um, I was, had to act like a, a professional. So early on it, it helped to establish my career and my, uh, and my work ethic throughout. I got into doing commercials. Uh, this was a Diet Coke commercial from uh, many, many years ago, uh, I got hooked into Donna Belichak, who was a local uh, talent agent back in the day, still is, but I uh, ended up getting, doing a national television commercial. Uh, I went to Ithaca College, studied film there, um, came back to Pittsburgh and started working in um, kind of corporate videos, a lot of corporate videos here in Pittsburgh. I bought a Steadicam in 1991. This is 
one of my early ones from, uh, this is actually a shot with DDI, Development Dimensions International, which was uh, a training and managerial training video production services. So I got a lot of experience through that. Uh, I was able to hook up with our good friend, Glenn Przborski, early on um, in my career. He, without him, I probably wouldn't be where I am today. Honestly, I can say that from the bottom of my heart. He allowed me to uh, practice Steadicam, do a lot of Steadicam, support me uh, shooting commercials uh, all throughout my early career. Um, this one being down in uh, Orlando with Sheets. Um, this guy was supposed to be like Jim Carrey, Sheets commercial down there, but uh, I definitely cut my teeth working with him. Uh, this was a uh, early Kennywood or Idlewild spot uh, from years ago. Uh, I, just through my career, I moved into then feature films. This is from Kingpin many years ago. Uh, some 3D things, 3D, this was Step Up 3D. So there's two cameras here. Um, and it's kind of a lot of wires and cables, kind of a mess. Um, this is from Rocky Balboa, uh, top of the steps, Sly. Uh, this is Dumb and Dumber 2. So there's uh, just a, a, a lot of career photos, a lot of things I've been able to do along the way. So now you ask the question, what actually does a camera operator do? Um, responsibilities of a camera operator. Well, we work with the director, or the DP and the actors to block the shots. Uh, then we execute the shot discussed. We should be compromising and uncompromising. What that means is you need to let go of some of the things. If, you, if your shot doesn't really turn out the way you like it, but the performance is fantastic, then um, you kind of have to go for the, for the performance and the actors. Um, effectively communicate with all the departments uh, to successfully, successfully, successfully complete the shot. That would be grip, electric, makeup, hair, actors, props. Um, because I'm the camera operator, I'm the one that sees, I see everything first, because I'm there by the camera. Um, it's very much different in narrative than it is in uh, shooting sports or shooting news or things like that. Sports, you know, you have to get that shot. I, yes, I'm expected to get the shot first, or at least the first few takes, but if I miss the ball going into the, into the um, end zone, I can, we can kind of do it again. <laughs> I might get yelled at, but anyway. Uh, so uh, as far as effectively communicating, it's, it's very much a, a lot of camaraderie, uh, collaborative. Um, for example, if, I, if the camera's set up and uh, the electrics put lights that are too close to the edge of the frame, I'm off getting coffee, not paying attention. Um, it's my fault that I'm not paying attention. We come back and I say, well, when did that light get there? You know, I have to be on it all the time and help the departments know what the shot is. Um, explain to them, someone asked me, I have to be very open to them, uh, you know, be friendly. That's one of, kind of one of my best pieces of advice as far as how to move along in your career narratively is be nice, be helpful, be involved, be available. Um, so basically those are some of the responsibilities of the camera department camera operator. All of this is based on the script. So you read the script, you get the story, uh, the characters in the script, kind of the emotional response of the script, locations, time of day or night. So if you get a script that's called Beware the Night, and it opens up with exterior rain in the winter, you want to avoid those. Um, what the era is. So when you read the script, you kind of get the idea of I can start to piece together in my head kind of what they're going for, what they may be going for, the look they're going for, the style of shooting, equipment that might be needed. You know, all these things, I'm not, you know, that's very much the director's responsibility, but uh, I am involved in that process uh, as much as I can. Uh, when we finally get the script, we get hired, we get a call sheet. Uh, on the call sheet shows the call time, uh, the scenes to be shot in the order which they're to be shot. Uh, the actors that are in the scene, um, the location, uh, the, uh, the department information. So basically everyone that's, there's, there's a whole readout in the side there of props, makeup, things that are expected uh, to happen you know, during that day and the props that might be needed and things like that. So all the departments know what, um, what's going on. And that's very important. Back of the call sheet, you have all the crews listed, all the members of, of the crew and the times that they're supposed to come in. Um, so we all know kind of what's, what's going on. As far as operating the camera technically, 
okay, over the years, uh, there have been many more pieces of equipment that come through, but basically we have the geared head. The geared head camera sits on top of that little rocker thing there. The wheels, uh, you move them and they pan and they tilt. Um, and it, if, as far as, uh, you know, more accurate things, I prefer the wheels. Uh, it's, it, but the fluid heads are great. Um, we all know what a fluid head does, it tilts up and down. There's fluid in there, you can adjust the, temperature, the tension of that. But uh, these are pretty much the two go-to heads that, as far as equipment that I use to actually pan and tilt the camera. We have what's called the lambda head, um, which is an underslung head. So if you need to be low on the ground, uh, you would mount that from the top on the Mitchell plate and uh, you could put the camera directly on the ground. Uh, nowadays, and because of COVID, uh, the remote heads have become very popular. These are the two axis remote heads. These are kind of the two that are the, the most popular, the Talon Very Zoom and the Moses head. And these are wireless or they can be, they can have a, a plug that plugs into them, but effectively you can either control it on a joystick or on the wheels that you can see there on the one picture on the left. We then get into uh, three axis stabilized heads. This is the newer version. This is an airy stabilized head uh, that um, will stabilize the camera and really from stabilizing because of something like this. We have these things called uh, techno cranes. Um, you can see that when that weight moves forward, the arm will contract or extend. Um, when that extension happens or if the base is moving, uh, you can get some vibration on the end of that. Uh, so those heads will take out that little minor vibration or can be big vibration if there's a wind. So that's why we go with the stabilized heads. Uh, the most common stabilized heads now um, are the, that have been the standard or the Scorpio head. Um, there's, you can see on top of there, there's a spring that, I, that isolates the head from the, whatever you're mounting it to. And there's a little rocker underneath that uh, gives your horizon stability. Uh, but that's one that's a, the other one, that, the other standard one is the lever head. Uh, the lever head, uh, same thing, it's, it's stabilized so you can mount it on a heart, on a vehicle, you can put it on a crane, uh, whatever you want to do, and um, it will stabilize that, that motion. Um, as far as the current heads that are really popular are the stabilized four axis heads. We have the Oculus, which is no longer, they've developed a newer head of this. It's smaller, a little more compact. And we have the matrix head, matrix head, matrix mode. It allows the crane or the head to be uh, put straight in line with the crane. So uh, instead of it hanging below the crane or above the crane, the end of that crane is much, you have a tighter tolerance so you can get into smaller holes and things like that. So that all this equipment, um, has to tell the story and I'll get into that in a minute. Specifically Steadicam parts, which is what I do. Uh, that's a specialty thing. We have the sled. The sled is based on the balance. That's what the camera mounts on. There's a monitor at the bottom and batteries to power the whole thing. We have the vest. The vest is what I wear uh, to support the arm in the camera. So the arm isolates my motion from the sled, takes up the my walking. Um, Within that nowadays, we have what's called the Tiffin Volt gimbal. The Volt has motors and belts on it, which will aid in horizon leveling. One of the banes of Steadicam operating is not staying uh, level. Uh, it, can, it can yaw like a helicopter. So this will aid in that, as well as the Vets Wave, which is a rocker which goes through a computer, which then you set your horizon and whatever the Steadicam is doing in the yaw axis, this will keep it level. There are no gyros on a Steadicam, but you can add gyros to a Steadicam to add instability for wind. Uh, the gyros don't wanna move anywhere, so it keeps your axis locked in uh, in a windy situation. All right, another bunch of stuff that's out now are gimbals. Okay, we have the uh, the Movi, the Ronin, um, all of these are all stabilized because of the motors and, uh, that are in there. 
We have what's called the AR Omega, which is a ring that sits on top of the Steadicam, which allows it to stay level, and it'll go from high mode to low mode. We have the Maxima, which is another gimbal. And we have what's called the Trinity, which is another, it's basically one of those Oculus heads mounted on top of the Steadicam. Uh, so you can go from low mode to high mode on the Steadicam and also stabilized. Okay, put all these together with lens choices. Um, you have anamorphic and you have spherical lenses. Okay, they all have different qualities. Anamorphic shows a great flare. Uh, you have flare highlights, flare characteristics. Uh, telephoto anamorphic. Uh, it, you're compressing, you know, compressing the lens, but it's still widescreen format. Uh, if you want to be wide and close, uh, you're into the actor's face. But because it's anamorphic, you have a lot of room there behind Tom Cruise. Uh, and, and because of the focus depth and the, you know, the focus limitations, uh, it really isolates the actor. Uh, with spherical, um, I can explain the difference between spherical and anamorphic in a minute here. Spherical uh, has a completely different um, feel to it. Uh, if you're close to an actor, it tends to warp their face, makes it a little more round. Um, uh, so you know, if, you're, if you're being wide and close or you're being long and close, I mean, these are the same shots relative, but obviously longer lens. You get less depth of field in the background, isolates the actors in the foreground. All of these are creative choices that can be made on the day. Um, all of these lens choices, everything that's here, means nothing without the story, without the content um, of what you're trying to tell, uh, ultimately, to an audience. Film formats. Okay, we have, nowadays we have four perf, three perf, not much film. I am currently shooting a film movie here in Pittsburgh. Uh, West Side Story, which I worked on, was a film uh, job. Uh, it's not used that much relatively anymore compared to the digital now. But um, all of these formats are basically um, your standard. You have anamorphic, super 35, um, and between four perf and three perf, three perf means you're only pulling down three perforations per exposure. So you're getting more film, more time in a magazine uh, instead of four perf, which is pulling down four perforations, which is then decreasing your time on uh, of your film run. Then we get into digital formats, which is absolutely mind numbing. Uh, I'm not really here to discuss these <laughs> formats because there are so many different variations on all of these cameras, and you're welcome to look these up. Um, and I, if you need notes about these, I can explain about all the different cameras that are out there. But all of these formats are uh, still uh, 185 or widescreen, or variations of that based on uh, whatever K you're shooting. Uh, it gets incredibly complicated. From my perspective, my job is to use all of those tools to tell a story. Uh, technically, I don't really know a lot of things. As long as I can look through the eyepiece and frame a shot, that's my job. My job is to use all of these tools to tell the story with the camera. Um, how I do that uh, is basically through a lot of years of experience. I've been fortunate to work with a lot of directors. I work with a lot of directors of photography. Um, technically, I am not that's not my job. My job is to work with the actors, to work with the director uh, and the director of photography. So we will block a shot. We will um, you know, work together with the, with the actors and the director. Um, so effectively, when we set up a, a scene, the director will have a private walkthrough with the actors. Um, they will then uh, rehearse with the crew. Uh, so they'll go technically through all of these points. Uh, camera assistant will lay marks for the actors um, and we'll use a lens finder to set where the camera is going to go so we can have uh, basically put a lens on, a, on, a, on a, an eyepiece and we can stand with the camera, stand with the lens, mark a height so the dolly grip can then come in, knows the height of where the dolly is going to go, sets that height. Uh, so all of this is done uh, after the rehearsal happens, so we all know what's happening. But we have marking rehearsal, and then after the marking rehearsal, much discussion ensues. Uh, basically, every department comes in, 
you know, wondering how long it takes, what we're going to see. Um, if, if there's a dresser in the way, um, set dresser will come in, move the dresser. Uh, if uh, there's, uh, lamps need to be put in, set dressers will do that. Electrician's gaffer will say, okay, where are we looking exactly? Generally, they have an idea already what's, you know, where the camera's going to go. But um, in, if, for example, uh, an actor may not hit a mark and I have to pan farther left or right, uh, I need to be aware of telling the electrician to the grip, say, you know, that, that stands a little bit close to, this, close to the shot. Just give me a little bit of room. Um, so after, after we've done all the blocking um, and the rough in, and then the stand-ins come in, they stand on the mark. Stand-ins will go through the, act, through the actions. Um, and then a final run-through. Final run-through is basically with the actors. They come in, uh, they'll, do, they'll do the scene, you know, um, after the final run-through, then if uh, they're standing up too quickly or something I didn't expect, uh, I can walk to the actor and say, could you just let me know how you're kind of standing up there? Because sometimes you stand up too quickly, it's hard to keep them in frame. And uh, if they're saying a line during standing up and they go out of frame, well, the line's off camera. So, um, you know, actors are great with that, uh, with explaining what they're going to do. Most of them are. Others can be a little more difficult. Or if uh, I just have to be on it and they're not really, um, they're not really helping, then I have to really dial in and get all these actors, you know, pay attention. Okay, so then we end up, if we're going to move the camera um, or move the actor or move both, um, this is basically, I just set my phone on a, on a Steadicam battery looking up for a Steadicam shot. But we can see um, different ways of moving the camera. I'm on the dolly there. Uh, that bottom right one is um, rigged off of an electric car that's pulling uh, a dolly with an actor on it. So uh, he's fake, he's riding a Segway or something like that. But um, all these, you know, all these, all this equipment we have still goes to telling the story and why we're doing the certain shot. What is the reason for doing the shot? Um, and, and all that goes through back to the script uh, and the emotional response of what we're trying to trying to tell. Uh, this again goes to more camera motion. I can be on a crane, uh, get boomed down. You know, 310 pound guy gets on as I get off because if he doesn't, the crane shoots up in the air. So there's a timing thing there. Um, with these movies, uh, this is how we hang the movie or the Ronin. They're supported overhead. Um, so all these tools again uh, are, are choices for um, for telling the story. You know, uh, I have to be able to proficiently operate all of these things. Over the years, um, these things that more and more come. So the more proficient I have to be, uh, operating the shot is really. 15% to, to use these tools is 15% of the job for me. The other bigger part is to be on set and to, um, and to be uh, in a position where it's very collaborative, uh, how, how to work, how to talk to somebody, how to talk to a director, how to talk to an actor. Um, just through years of experience, it takes, uh, it takes all this time to, to get this stuff done. So um, it's, like I said, it's been, it's been quite a career. So we ended up making the shot. Well, making the shot, um, for me, as the shot's happening, you know, my eyes are open, I check and recheck. So if the boom is gonna be a little close to a certain part going through a doorway or something, I just go to the boom operator and make sure that he or she are aware um, of my, my problem with what's gonna happen. And then they make me aware of what they're getting into. So we work together, you know, it's very collaborative. Um, reiterate instructions. Uh, again, uh, if, if a grip uh, needs to flag a light or a flare at some point, just have to make sure where they're going to be. Um, if you expect everything to go wrong all the time, hopefully it doesn't. But um, uh, when, you're, when you're prepared for everything then, um, and, and being very collaborative and open to your crew, that will uh, facilitate a much better shot and product. So yeah, we roll sound, um, roll a camera, camera assistant goes in with a slate. Uh, hits the slate, which then syncs your video with your audio or your film with your audio. And then uh, we move on or we make adjustments. You know, it's that simple and it's that, it's that difficult. Um, as an operator and anyone in the freelance business, I don't work for a particular, you know, most of you probably don't very much freelance. 
so relationships are very important. Um, it's all about meeting people, working with people, being nice, being collaborative. Um, uh, so I can get a job from anybody. I can get a job for a key grip from a gaffer. Um, they will recommend me in a meeting on a feature film. And, um, uh, you know, then I can work with more people. It's all about building relationships and um, continuing a career, which I've been very fortunate to do. So uh, any questions at this point? And that's a lot to go through. And we can certainly go back because uh, there's not a lot of time to explain 30 years of a career. But uh, I think you get the idea that, you know, technically, uh, aside from me having to figure out how to use all this equipment and use it proficiently, my job is to, you know, tell a story with this equipment. And it's not really a matter of um, being a, a technician, you know, more of a, a more of a, um, a visual storyteller. So any questions at this point? Yeah, John, uh, yeah. Buzz. Um, actually, we are starting to get some questions here. And here's a nice one. Uh, what is your most memorable shoot? What is the most memorable shoot you've ever worked on? Yeah, that, that's, that's almost, that's like asking what your favorite musician is. I think they're all, they're all definitely, um, they're, they're all, they all have meaning and importance, you know, and, and not even, just even from building a career, building my knowledge of how to do the job. Um, but I think, uh, one would be West Side Story. It's a big job. Um, it, it just very big. Uh, we had a lot of equipment there. The dancers were fantastic. The music, um, it was just very inspiring. The dancers were inspiring. Um, the post, which is another one I did with Steven, um, a lot of steady cam work in that. Um, that was good. Um, I did a movie called uh, White Fang years ago, which was um, shot in Alaska. So just being in Alaska shooting that uh, was was great. Um, yeah, uh, a couple of romantic comedies, a movie called um, uh, Sweet Home Alabama was fun shooting in, in, uh, down in Atlanta. Uh, just a great environment, great people. Um, so I, I think when I talk about a good movie, I go back to the people that are involved. Because uh, again, it's very it's it's about collaboration. It's about relationships. So um, that you know that's the difference. The difference between a good movie and a bad movie for me is is what uh, you know, the people that I meet and the people that I associate with. That's cool. Yeah, it is all about the experiences in the end. Yeah. Um, kind of related to the favorite kids question. Choose one. Do you have any favorite locations that you've shot in, uh, particularly? Yeah, I was in Iceland. I did a movie called uh, the I did the Iceland part of a film called um, uh, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty. Uh, so being in Iceland was was a, a treat. It was it was really exciting. Um, I, I, I just did a movie in Ireland, uh, finished that in November, um, and that was that was also great. The crews over there are fantastic. Um, not that they're any better than the United States crews, but they have a certain way of doing things. And uh, I really bought into it. Those locations were great. And of course, shooting in Pittsburgh, shooting in Pittsburgh for all these years, who can't help but love shooting in Pittsburgh. Oh, just down the road. I, yeah, I haven't, I haven't worked. I'm starting a job here now, but I haven't worked here in about six and a half years. I've been traveling all over the states and different countries. So it's nice to be home working. Yeah. It is. Yeah, your own bed sometimes. Yeah. Uh, and, and related to that, Glenn's asking, uh, did you have another film coming up in Pittsburgh that you could talk about yet? Uh, since you don't get here a lot, perhaps nothing too soon. But Yeah, well, the one, yeah, like I said, I'm starting this job now. It's called A Man Called Otto, which is based on a film called A Man Called Ove, which was a, a Swedish film. Um, and uh, basically, it's, it's, uh, it stars Tom Hanks and... Um, who I've worked with before, which is, um, it's nice to work with someone who you've worked with before, at least as far as an actor, because uh, you know the relationship, you know what to expect from them. And I, I kind of already have done that path before. So uh, yeah, so I'll be doing that. Um, that's through, it's through till May. And um, it's actually very close locations for me. Um, so I, it, most of them are 10 minutes from where, I'm, where my house is. And that never happens. So I'm very happy about that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, cool. Glenn. Thanks for starting me. Glenn. I appreciate it. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah, that's the same Glenn. Yeah, I yeah. have a, uh, yeah. oh, look, your shooting crew uh, getting some B-roll there, looks like. Yeah. yeah. Good. 
that 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 the uh, Rigneron doesn't look particularly stable. Yeah, no, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's part of the story. That's what that's what they want, you know. Yeah, I, I personally have a question because you know I was emailing you earlier um, that a couple of year, couple of decades ago. Now I worked with uh, uh, Garrett Brown on something, and he's of course the inventor of the Steadicam. So you, you know, any any Garrett Brown stories. Uh, yeah, because of the uh, because of the Steadicam Operator Association, um, I they, they asked me to teach these courses. So um, and they have one in, in Philadelphia twice a year. So I see Garrett uh, there, and he's he's always just a very calming source for if, if I'm going through something uh, or some weird Steadicam thing that's going on, if something's not working technically. I mean, he's, he's an absolute genius. Um, he's invented many many things. Um, but just to know he's still there and out there to call. I was doing Rocky Balboa, and um, he because he lives in Philadelphia or near Philadelphia, uh, and I was working there. I I called him. I said, "Hey, you know, let's let's go, okay, hook up with you." And so he says, "Yeah, come out to dinner." So we hung out with dinner, and we talked about his shooting the original Rocky. Um, and during that shot, running up the stairs. Uh, they're having problems with the camera battery, and I think they had a hot wire, a car battery to it. Uh, and it ended up being, not being in uh, at 24 frames a second. It was something like 22 frames a second. So if you look at that shot, you know, Sly's jumping up and down, and it looks a little Benny Hilly because he's the camera's not running at speed. It's running too slow. Um, and there was no sound. It had to be crystal sync. It was all just shooting MOS. Uh, so that's you know one of those stories that you hear from him, and he said, you know, when you're up at the top of those stairs and you're going up that last bit, those stairs aren't spaced right. So just be careful. You think that stairs are spaced a certain way, but sure enough, um, we get up to do the shot and Sly. I said, you know, I was like, Sly, do you want? How do you want to do this shot? He goes, well, we'll just do it the way that, you know your buddy Garrett did it. Just start here and do up and do the thing. So we've been waiting all day to do this shot. Uh, and uh, he was waiting for the, he, he knew the snowstorm was coming. So they ended up doing the shot and these giant flakes of snow just came pouring down out of the sky. And it was absolutely gorgeous. The silver tone to the city, um, just, it really was a gorgeous thing. And I started to do the shot and I'd seen this shot hundreds of times. And uh, it, it's because he had this battery connected to a cable uh, and when he's running up there, you could kind of see him, the camera's kind of doing this on the way in the shot, and it's, it's kind of out of sync a little bit. Uh, and it's it's really not something I think he was ever really happy with because of the technical thing going on. And when I did the shot, I was, because I'd seen it so many times, I'm watching the monitor, and I'm almost imitating what I'd seen all these years. <laughs> I get to the top, you know, the director of photography goes over and says, you want to uh, you want to do that again? It's like uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But it's because I'd seen it so many times, and I realized that wait a minute, I'm actually doing this shot right now, and I was not. I was so distant. I didn't realize it was me doing it. I was completely out of it. And then when I did realize it, um, yeah, okay, we should probably do it again. So we did it again. But having him, you know, having to talk to him, I t told him that later. He, was, he, was, he laughed, but yeah, he's a great guy. He's just, he's really a, just a, he's a force to be reckoned with. And we all thank him. We call it the Garrett, we're bowing to Garrett, every Steadicam operator who, uh, when we, when you pick up a Steadicam, you, you, you want to bow, you want to bend your, you know, at the, at the hips, and then you step into it and pick it up. So we, all, we always call it bowing to Garrett because, you know, thank you, Garrett, for giving me a career and picking it up. But yeah. Good man. Very good man. Cool. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, we have more questions coming in, uh, three right now. Um, Will's got a great question. Um, the, the name is Steady Cam, hence, you know, it's steady and it's shot by nature. What if you're the director wants something shaky? Can you do that in the rig or do you have to remove it from the rig? How do you, how do you go shaky on a Steady Cam? Yeah, you can. Do, uh, I've done it where I've held the back of the camera and just kind of done this along the way. The thing about the, the difference between handheld and Steadicam, obviously, is um, you, when it's on your body, you know, any of this kind of stuff gives it a jerkiness to it. And the steady, it's hard to do jerky with Steadicam. You can do kind of smooth, not stable things. Um, so, you know, and that, and the other, th the other thing I've done is I've loosened the, I've loosened the bolts on the camera <clears throat> on a Steadicam. 
so you get a vibration. So I could just do this every once in a while on the gimbal and the camera will vibrate. So it gives kind of that feel. But um, yeah, generally if the director's asking for something that wants to be that kind of squirrely, you, you end up doing it handheld or uh, with all this equipment now, there's ways to uh, lever heads or any kind of remote head to just kind of put it on that and wiggle the wheels uh, so you get this shaky thing. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that's kind of what I would offer. And if they said, no, it still has to be on Steadicam. There's, there's some other tools coming out now that um, uh, they are out now called the ZG. And what it is is basically a, it's kind of a tilty panty thing that, that sits on the, uh, on the Steadicam arm. So you can get that handheld look but without the, the jerking of, of, the of the body kind of, you know, emulating, it still takes the smoothness out of the camera. So, um, yeah, that's kind of what I would offer. I think you missed a spot. Yeah, I think it's a little flare right yeah, there. Yeah. yeah. Um, it, a couple more now. Ed's going to have one for you on deck. And then George is asking, um, do you have a preference uh, for, for your capture, film or digital? You've seen them both over the years and decades. What's your preference? Yeah, I think my, I mean, the camera, the film camera's heavy. They've gotten, the, the video camera's gotten, the digital camera's gotten a little wider. Um, for Steadicam, you almost want bigger because that inertia keeps things stable. The smaller the camera, those things, you know, if, if, imagine if you have a pencil in your hand and you're painting it back and forth like this, you know, it's very easy. But if you have a, a 10 foot long pipe and you're doing that, it's very hard to pan. So it's the same thing with a steady cam. The more inertia you have, the less the camera wants to drift and move. So bigger, heavier cameras, um, you know, your back doesn't like it, but certainly the result of, of, uh, of having that weight is, is definitely seen in a more stable image. Um, as far as preference, uh, yeah, I started with film, just the smell of the film. Um, and also, if you have a film camera, a steady cam, because the motors are turning, there's a motor in the magazines for Panavision, motor in the magazine and motor in the, in the camera, it also kind of acts like a gyro. Once that's turning, it wants to stay straight. Whereas if you're in a digital camera, uh, which is a lifeless hunk of wires and GAC and heat sink, it just kind of sits there and doesn't help you that way. Um, so uh, I prefer I prefer film. Although now the, they've been the cameras have been sitting around in boxes. The eyepieces are getting yellowed. The glasses you can't really see as good uh, through the eyepiece. Um, so what you know with these new digital the new digital cameras um, they have their advantages, um, but I still prefer that hearing that motor you know next to me. As far as the the image, as long as I can see. What's going on? That's that's what you know. My 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 deal is you know as long as I can see the frames, but having that motion, I I, I love that smell and things. So you know, yeah, that's I interesting. I never thought about that. The again the, the gyro effect yeah. that makes a lot of sense. And I suppose, of course, you're. Thanks. Thanks. I had some lint. It happens. So what happens when you're black? You know. Um, but the, uh, of course, the, the workflow downstream of, of what you capture is so different now with digital versus film. So do, do you, does that ever impact you too, like checking dailies that are film versus instant dailies on digital? There's That's kind of related, right? Do you have to yeah. wait longer with film versus digital? Not necessarily, because by the time the editor gets it, it's pretty quick. I mean, once it goes through the lab, uh, it gets transferred to digital anyway, then it gets sent out. Because we, we have dailies on on our iPads or computers. There's... there's um, companies that just release it and they have all the, you know, the protection for, you know, pirating and things like that. But uh, no, it's not the same. Like, you know, we, there aren't really dailies. It used to be at the end of the day, uh, you'd go into a screening room, which was fantastic because you could see your work large in front of you, not looking into the phone or an iPad. Um, and back when I first started doing Steadicam, we used, there was a green screen monitor, which the operating size of the image was about that big. So you're just trying to see an image and figure out what's going on in there. Uh, whereas today, the, you know, the screens are sometimes are eight inches on these Steadicam, so you can see everything. But back then, it was this black uh, green screen. It was green because it came from bombers. It was bomber technology. And, uh, you know, the sky's blue, the grass is green. Well green absorbs the blue, so there's no reflection, so it was a perfectly clear image. Um, 
uh, so to see it from going from green and then going to the, to the dailies and seeing it in full color in front of you is just the most epic thing ever to say, my gosh, that looks great, you know. Um, and then you're with the producers and they'll either they're clapping or you're getting fired or <laughs> sitting in a seat going, oh, that's not good, you know. But to also be in that environment with sharing that, you know, you, get, you know, it's a big shot and you're sharing it with all the people live like that. That doesn't happen anymore. And it was something I miss. And just to learn you know, the, the, the nuance and the finesse of operating, you know, how, why I have this much headroom in a shot compared to this much, you know, all of that tells a story. You know, if you have a lot of headroom, you know, the actor seems to be lower in frame, you know, being crushed by life kind of thing. You know, if you're like this, it's like he's being, you know, but if he's up here, then he's, more you know bigger in the frame so all these little techniques work you know short siding you know if i'm standing here and i'm looking off talking to an actor that way that's a certain way of editing but if i'm here looking that way you know they're, they're completely different emotional effects based on the story based on the relationships of the actors um, but yeah uh, having the dailies and being there live was was pretty great you know you're sitting next to the focus puller because there's someone who actually is pulling focus, you know, it's not automatic. There's a human being who is nowadays with wireless, they have um, a little box with a wheel on it and it tells a motor on the lens to turn you know, the focus. Now there's, there's, they have equipment now that help with um, being more specific because the, these sensors that are 65 millimeter sensors and the digital cameras, the depth of field is to the point where uh, you know, what, and not just what eye do you want to focus, but what part of the eye do you want to be in focus? Um, so they have equipment now that uh, basically looks like a video game to me, and it's all based on triangulation and things like that, mathematics. But they're looking at the monitor, the assistant's looking at the monitor and, you know, checking these bars and looking at the eye. And, you know, so there's someone actually doing that. If it's with a steady cam, you can't touch the steady cam. Used to be you could. You know, everyone was touching the lens and you know manipulating the focus that way. But with Steadicam, you couldn't do that because it bumps the camera. So they had to develop this wireless system, which then they say, yeah, let's use it on a standard, you know, on a crane, or let's use it on uh, on a dolly. And now it's that's kind of that's what it is now. It's all wireless focus system. And those ladies and gentlemen who do that, I don't know how they do the focus. I just that is some other worldly thing of being able to do that you know and i really respect and appreciate that job hardest job on set for sure pulling focus because if you notice it you get fired if, it's, <laughs> if you don't notice it you don't even think about it you know it's pretty that's art pretty, yeah pretty crazy artists yeah. lots of artists yeah. on a set you know. definitely yeah um we've got three more questions here at this point and one the first one is going to be by uh, one of our um uh, section oh, managers uh, and uh, Ed, I think you've got a question here about CGI. Yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, hi, Buzz. Uh, great presentation so far. Yeah, nice. um, yeah just uh, interested to know if you've been involved with any, uh, you know, features that are kind of CGI heavy, and if you have any experience with that, what uh, what kind of special challenges uh, does that present for the camera operator on set? Yeah, yeah. There's a little movie called it was a. Uh, the Avengers, first Avengers, it was kind of, you know, just a couple CGI shots, <laughs> but no, yeah, seriously, <laughs> that was, um, yeah, one, in fact, I just did a movie with, uh, in Ireland, uh, with the same person I was working with directly on that, uh, in New York City, but we talked about this one shot, but anyway, uh, the shot I did in, the movie I did in Ireland, I can't really speak of it, but there's a, uh, one of the, one of the characters doesn't exist, it's all being built in the computer, so along with that, in this story, in the Avengers, I was standing outside of the uh, um, Grand Central Station and one of these ships comes down and crashes. And uh, so he shows me the picture of the ship. And OK, so there's no, well, how big is it? Well, it's big. Well, how, how big? Well, you know, it's, it's a ship. It's like, OK, how big is a ship? I mean, what, what am I looking at? Well, just do like just to, you know, just kind of pan across and tilt down and have it land. and. Okay, you know, so basically just pointing at a building in the sky and I just kind of do this. And, it, and it's like, well, is it fast enough? Uh, yeah, it should, we can speed that up. We can slow, we'll speed, we'll slow it down. We can make it smaller, we, you know. So, you know, t these days they can do really anything digitally. Um, 
like I said, they're building an entire character in, in interacting with live actors. So, you know, I'd have to think of, well, how tall is this character going to be when they're fighting? Um, and it, you, you tilt up and well, how fast would the character tilt up? It's maybe like this. Well, we can speed it up, you know. Well, you can't because there's an actor in the foreground and their hand will start doing something fast. So I have to make sure that speed is right based on what, you know, this actor that doesn't exist is going to do. So those are challenges because uh, we really don't know what, they, there's a concept of what it looks like. There's definitely previs, previsualization, mm -hmm. you know, which are cells that are done uh, with animation built into it. Uh, but still, when you're on set and you're figuring it out, you know, the, the question is, well, am I hold the bat, you know, so, but there's a lot of departments involved. Again, collaboration, uh, talking, uh, talking things out. Everyone's in agreement, director, director of photography, visual effects coordinator, um, all of them are, you know, kind of on the same page. So, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's the big one. It's not knowing really what's there and be trying to figure out how to make it work. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking with my question is how do you, how do you shoot things that aren't there? You know, yeah, interesting. Yeah, thank you. This, yeah, it's going to play behind the scenes here of some movies. So, this was actually another pretty heavy. It was called After Earth, heavy effects where there are monsters that didn't exist. So we had to kind of figure out what's what's going on. And this is emulating a meteor, whatever thing. And this, this is another movie, but yeah, yeah. Any yeah, okay? Any more questions? Good. Yeah, we do have more. Um, yeah. This is great. Um, so, have you ever fallen off a steady cam? Uh, well, a, a, not a steady cam, but a, a perch, a chair, a lift. Have yeah, you ever I, fallen? I've fallen with a steady cam once. I was uh, doing a shot where I'm running backwards down a down a uh, an uh, alley, and there's a dog with a hamburger in his mouth, and I was in low mode where the camera's underneath. So, in this that behind the scenes, the camera's on top, but turn everything upside down, the camera's in low mode. And I was running with a dog backwards down an alley. We did the rehearsal and uh, we were ready to roll. And after we did, we did the take, well, the set dresser had put um, garbage bags in the way. So as I'm running backwards, I hit the garbage bag and lost it and fell. And that is the only time I fell. I slipped once, which was the last job in Ireland. We were very much shooting outside. Um, uh, in, in rocky terrain and mud, and I was kind of backing up a hill and I slipped and uh, landed on my knee, but that wasn't, you know. But yeah, I mean, it happens, and you have to know that it can happen and be aware of it. So, the situation where I'm running, uh, where it's just not safe to run or the shot's gonna be, you know, I can't keep up with somebody, then we'll put it on an electric car or an ATV, or, um, you know, so I'm actually being pulled or a rickshaw. So I'm not having to run, and it's just a safer kind of way to do it. That, that reminds me of that famous shot in The Shining where the, uh, the little kid in the trike was going in the circles around the, that big room with the carpet, and that was somebody that was somebody running after him, right? I mean... Yeah, he was in a wheelchair. So he basically rigged it out of a wheel. There may have been a doorway dolly. Anyway, he was, yeah, he was basically rigged. So he wasn't wearing the camera. It was on a hard mount. You can hard mount the arm to, uh, you know, off your body, and, and in that way, um, you know, he can keep the camera also very, very low to the ground. Uh, and yeah, it was that was a that's a classic shot. It's just a great shot, and the sound design is what made that shot. You know, just going through off the rug and then going on the floor and all this was, it was, it was fantastic. Yeah. Um, a really important question here. We've got a lot of students that are watching, and we'll watch this video later. Uh, what kind of suggestions do you have uh, beyond training stage crew? Um, <laughs> what kind of suggestions do you have for folks that might want to become a camera operator or director of photography or anything even related? I mean, how do they jump into this business? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's when I started, you know, I breezed over all that stuff. When I started in Pittsburgh, there was uh, there were a lot of corporate companies here, Fisher Scientific, Westinghouse, um, uh, DDI, um, and, even, and even WQED was producing a lot of things. So there was a lot of work for freelancers, commercials with uh, Hartwick Wisborski and uh, quite a few other commercial production companies here. TPC, uh, which John is very familiar with, uh, they would have in-house production and things going on up there. So there was a lot of things going on. 
And uh, for a freelancer, you could, you could get work. You may not be doing what you wanted to, but at least you could be on a set and learning. Uh, you know, nowadays, it's, it's, there's a lot of more opportunities open, even with YouTube videos. You know, you get on YouTube uh, and you can practice your craft and people can watch it and give you feedback and reviews. And it depends on what department you want to get into. Um, there are many different opportunities in the film business, many different, uh, you know, the, from grip, electric, um, oh my gosh, makeup, hair, there's so many things. You know, everyone wants to be the director of the camera department. Uh, so, you know, it's, diff it's difficult uh, to get, the, I think one of the ways to get into the camera department, if you want to get in union narrative stuff, is to try to get into a rental house and learn the equipment. And, and through the rental house and learning the equipment, you're also meeting camera assistants and operators that come in there to prep the equipment. Um, so hopefully one day someone won't be available or um, an opportunity arises where it's a, a smaller student film or something where one of those assistants is shooting. Uh, you know, if you, if you, again, it's about relationships. Um, if you've, you know, you've gotten to know somebody through the rental house, you know, maybe they'll ask you on the job, which will then, you know, build your career. But it, you know, it takes a long time. I always say 10,000 hours to get something down. And it's not, it's, you, you can, it, and there's also no right way or wrong way to get in. You get in a certain way, you know, you ask 100, 100 people the narrative thing, how they got into it, you'll get 100 different answers. Um, it, what it comes down to is believing in yourself, being nice, being available, not staring at your phone when someone's talking to you, um, paying attention. You know, if you're looking at somebody, if you see somebody, if you're on, just, you happen to be on a job, and you're a production assistant, and you're staying there on your phone, you're playing with your phone, door opens and some poor person is carrying a, just a handful of bottles and the plastic wrapper fell off and the bottles are falling everywhere, don't just go, go help the person. Because that person may be a producer one day, and then, uh, yeah, so go help the person on the phone. So, you know, just be available. You know, these phones have taken people out of reality, and certainly on a set, used to be when, you know, between takes, um, everyone would be kind of talking quietly and shh, you know, now there's no shushing anymore because everyone's just on their phone staring at YouTube videos. So just be available, be present, you know, have connections, make connections, tell stories. Um, uh, yeah, like I said, there's no right or way, wrong way. Um, if you want to shoot, start shooting. If you want to write, start writing. Um, just do it, get practice, make, make mistakes. Um, when you're out shooting something in video or taking pictures, um, know the parameters of focus, know, how, know what you can get away with. You know, if it's too dark and you're shooting something too dark, know what you can get away with in post, with all the tools in post to brighten things, to enhance contrast if you want to shoot. Um, yeah, there's just a lot of different ways to do it. Uh, and it, it's not easy, a lot of competition out there. But longevity, believing in yourself, believing the dream, you can get into stunts, um, that's always available to you. So, yeah, just keep going, keep going, and you know, the sky's the limit if you let, if you let it be, and don't get down on yourself. You know, that's, best that's, advice I can give. That's excellent advice. It's like they all say, follow your passion. You know, yes, if that yeah. intersects with skills, then then you're off to the races. And opportunity, yeah, that's right. Yeah, right, and yeah. opportunity. It's like a trifecta. Um, yep. I, I would uh, solicit to our um, uh, attendees, if you have any other questions, so please uh, send them our way. But I've got another one myself, and it's kind of related to well, the technology has been emerging, right? Uh, from down the pike, we've got IT workflows now and everything in IT, it seems, um, which is opening up a lot more opportunities. But how does all that impact what the technology and those workflows? Where do you see that impacting camera work in the future, five, 10 years from now? Yeah, you know, again, from my perspective, once, you know, from, from me, as an operator, from me, once it, once they say wrap at the end of the day, I know my work is complete and it's done. One, you know, from that point on, um, you know, obviously technology is going to change. How that's going to change, I don't know. Um, I think it comes down to what medium it's going to be presented in, um, you know, because of all the streaming things now. Will theaters go away? I hope not. Um, will VR become the thing? Maybe, uh, you, you know, uh, um, I, you know I, I don't know. It, it's, it's, it could be anything. It could, and it could be something we never heard of, holograph, you know, hol however. But um, 
yeah, you know, things change, things build, things come back to the way, you know, we're still shooting film. So, I mean, uh, there's a reason for that. It's, uh, it, you know, it's, um, it's a medium that still is being used uh, and it's still an efficient way. It's, it's the best way to store images, you know, because it's just a piece of film. You put it in a can, it'll last for years and you should see it again. Where, you know, if you go to your, take your digital pictures, you know, the prints could fail or your phone blows up and the zeros and ones can't get recognized anymore, well, it, it doesn't exist. But with film, that negative exists. It's there. It can always be gone back to, you know. So, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting. Yeah. Cool. Um, I, it looks like we have dried up on our questions here. Uh, and so I'll, I'll say one more chance. Anybody else that have anything, everything to ask of Buzz before we let him get back to the shooting he's got? Lined up. Yeah, I know as you know, it's breezing through all this stuff. It's very complicated. There's a lot of equipment out there. And, um, you know, if, if you if you go look back at this on YouTube or something and there's something that a question you have about a certain piece of equipment, I'd certainly be happy to answer those questions or a lot of information just on, you know, on the web for all these different pieces of equipment. But, um, yeah, I know that the, the, the technical part of it is, is important, but you know, from, you know, my, from my perspective, it's the storytelling. You know, I, I tell a, a story I tell is, you know, let's say Steven Spielberg has his camera and the film camera and Giannis is shooting it and they're putting it at a square, one foot square piece of grass. And then over here you have uh, David, Alfred Hitchcock pointing it at one foot square piece of grass. David Lean, you know, over here with his anamorphic widescreen over here. Um, and then I walk in with a, you know, 1974 RCA VCR with the thing on my back and I'm pointing at my square piece of grass. And somebody says, action. On mine, a worm comes up, starts looking around, and this bird flies in and lands, looks at the worm, takes the worm and flies away. Well, which one are you gonna look at? Which one is interesting? Well, the one, it doesn't matter what was shot on, who's directing it, it's the content in which you're watching. So you can get more, sometimes you get more emotional reaction out of, you know, uh, a military person coming home to see their daughter or son uh, than you do out of watching an hour and a half movie. So it's all about the content. You know, the equipment's one thing, the cameras, what camera you're using, you know, it, sometimes it matters, but really you know, it's, it's what you're watching. It's the, it's the emotional connection with um, what's going on on screen and what you're trying to show the, the people watching it. So. That was, that's my interest. That's what I do. You know, I don't, I don't like things. Um, I just try to learn, hear all the information and put it together and how I interpret a scene. So, um, yeah, there you go. Sounds like human, humanity still matters. People need to connect. Yeah, totally. Yeah. That's what yeah. entertainment is. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Content is king. That's a long-term phrase that I've always liked is it's all about the content. Yeah. Um, Hey, John Humphrey, our chairman, um, do you want to come back up with some uh, some wrapping thoughts here? And, and Buzz, is there any, do you have a, if, if somebody does want to get in touch with you, you've offered that, um, how would they do that? Do you have a website or, or LinkedIn? Or I don't, anything? I mean, you can, you can email me and if I get back to you quickly, I will. If, uh, you know, I may not, um, but um, uh, I can certainly, you know, give my email and if you would like to email me, go right ahead. And that is, I don't know if you want to put it out there in the, in the Simpty thing, or I can tell you now if, if we're going to know that. But uh, yeah, it's jbuzzmo.com at gmail.com. Yeah, Gmail, jbuzzmo. Okay, cool. Yeah, we'll put that in the, uh, the description information too for the video. So yeah. if you can check that out later. Yeah, so I got to thank Viewpoint here. This was a fantastic... <laughs> Tyler and my two buddies here, Victor and Gary, they had a lot of work to do. But uh, yeah, this, this place was great and they went far beyond uh, what I expected. So yeah, Gary, good friend. Oops. Yeah. On his phone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, great, great. You know, yeah. you're, I'm, I'm gonna interrupt and say one more thing. You're proving one more important point. You gotta have a sense of humor. Yeah, well, that's you know. the point. I mean, if you're not having fun doing this, it's no point in doing it. So I, you have to have fun. If you can't, you can't wake up with a smile and go to work. Um, yeah, I've been very fortunate to work with great people and uh, try to maintain a great attitude. And because uh, it, it, it's fun. I mean, you're entertaining it. You're trying to entertain people. Either either it's, either you're sadly entertaining, 
you know, through a sad story. Um, but it, it is entertainment and, uh, it, you know, you have to have fun. It, 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 it just makes the days go better because we're all, we're working 12, 14 hour days with the same people, um, you know, five days a week. And, uh, to have that sense of humor is very, very, very important. Yeah. Very important. So, yeah, I'm glad you put up with these, these guys walking around. <laughs> yeah. And this was a great hour-long rehearsal, so we're about to go live. So are you ready yeah, to go? Good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, but thanks yeah. for having me. Yeah, we did all the blocking. Right. Uh, yeah. uh, now we're That's ready. Right. That's right. Uh, Buzz, it was great meeting you at the Christmas party at Viewpoint. And uh, uh, I go back a long way with the Arts Burgers at Viewpoint. And, and sure. as a matter of fact, uh, Glenn Przborski and I uh, both went to Coco High School in Florida. So Glenn and I go back a long way as well. And uh, I, I know, I've talked to Glenn, I know he helped you get started in your career. And I hope that this provides some information for people who want to get started in their careers. Yeah. Yeah, just go for it. Learn all you can, you know, experiment all you can. And, you know, when you get in a real situation, hopefully you've been there before. Again, expect everything to go wrong all the time. And if you're prepared, you know, uh, you'll be able to solve those problems. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. Well, uh, I, I'm going to close the meeting by thanking you again, Buzz. It was great. Uh, this will be recorded for anyone who uh, missed it. And also it'll be posted on the Simply National website as well as ours. And uh, for people, we had a big turnout for this meeting. And for uh, those people that are here, uh, we have Simply Pittsburgh website, Facebook, other ways to get in touch with this, us for future, future meetings. And um, uh, this is our first noon meeting. And uh, we may try that some more in the future. Typically, they have been 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. Yeah. And uh, I'm also looking forward to our first in-person meeting someday in the near future. Looks like COVID spike has uh, uh, passed and uh, there's a decline in new infections. And it, I'm optimistic that in the next couple of months, we can try an in-person meeting with food for the people who attend. That's always good. All right. So again, thank you very much, Buzz. I'm going to end the meeting now, unless uh, Bill, you have uh, an objection to that. Uh, no, all the questions we've gotten answered. So thanks everyone for spending okay. your time, your lunchtime with us. And, and Buzz, yeah. viewpoint as well. Exactly, viewpoint too. Yeah. See you later, Buzz. Thanks. All right. See you. Thanks. Okay. Bye. Bye.